Since African countries came to independence, they have made strides in both political, economic, social domains, especially uh, but politically with the institution of uh, democratic elections. It is clear that uh, the establishment of uh, democratic principles have shown to what extent elections have brought a great master throughout the change, rebirth, and renewal across Africa. Elections offer an opportunity to deepen, consolidate, institutionalize democracy, and strengthen good governance systems across Africa. In an era where interest in politics is increasing, especially among young people, we begin to analyze the changes that can brought Africa's political sphere and how the pattern of democracy can be redefined in the African context, even though it was a prevalent moment in West Africa in the year 2022 with a series of codes. 2023 is not election year for some countries in Africa, including Nigeria. Sierra Leone, Zimbabwe, Madagascar, South Sudan, Somaliland, Sudan, Liberia, Libya, Gabon, according to uh, the Electoral Institute for Sustainable Development, Sustainable Democracy in Africa, a great milestone that we will, of course, herald alternation and see some leaders regain their position. However, a focus this day on the program, the Pan African debate, is to ascertain potentiality of these pending elections in strengthening democracy across Africa and also to analyze uh, the extent or to what extent this election can uh, uh, redefine the models of democracy in Africa. How can we invigorate Africa's democracy? What are the stakes as these nations race for elections in the months ahead? What are the stakes as uh, nations or countries across Africa prepare to head to the polls in the months ahead? The year 2023 is, of course, uh, an election year for some countries across Africa. But today, uh, on the program, the Pan-African Debate, we want to analyze how elections serve as litmus test uh, for a democracy. We want to, of course, uh, look at how far elections have redefined the pattern of democracy and of course understand democracy uh, bringing it uh, to the african context ladies and gentlemen thank you for joining us this day uh, on the program the pan-african uh, debate brought to you by the pan-african television africa media and of course uh, today we continue to analyze issues which are of utmost importance to the uh, continent africa what is democracy what is at stake do you think the pending elections that will hold across the continent this year will bring a change to what we call democracy how do political uh, uh, leaders or uh, leaders of course uh, uh, bring forth uh, their campaign promises to materialize in the tenets of democracy this is what we are going to be discussing in the course of the program that runs for two hours and of course it is informative and as well interactive in the course of the program you'll be permitted to call via whatsapp to uh, participate or share your own opinion of what you think do you think uh, elections in africa are the only way of maintaining full democracy that we'll discover in the case of the program without uh, wasting uh, uh, much time we kick uh, of course we kick off uh, with the introduction of the ex, uh, uh, this panel of experts who are here this day to analyze this very important topic, bringing to light the importance of democracy and asking if uh, democracy only exists with uh, elections. Uh, uh, with pleasure that I introduce to you uh, Dr. Michael Demancher. He's a civil society and also general coordinator for the uh, New Era Youth for Africa. Hello to you, Dr. Demancher. It's a pleasure hosting you this day on the Pan-African Television. You're welcome. Thanks so much, uh, Clarice. It's a pleasure to be here after uh, some periods of blackout on my side. And I think that it's always a pleasure to be on African media uh, because, of course, our media is the voice of Africa. It speaks for Africa. And knowing the power and the far-reaching uh, echoes that African media carries across Africa, I think that it's always important to be able to share honest views because I know that Africa's, uh, uh, African youth 
uh, take what we say on African media for gospel truth. And therefore, standing here, not just as a civil society leader and also as a traditionalist, I think that it is also it's important that we are discussing a topic that touches much more on African traditional leaders because, you know, we moved away from the dictatorship. I want to call it traditional dictatorship uh, of the tr African traditional leaders to what we, now we call democracy because when I say to you understand what I mean that at first African traditional leaders uh, were not voted. Uh, they didn't understand what voting is all about Absolutely. and of course now it, it was a very very difficult transition for Africans to leave that, those monarch, monarchic institutions now to democratic institutions. So I'm so happy to be able to share my views and with the other panelists there around Africa and the world uh, on this topic. Uh, it's always a pleasure, Dr. Dimantra, to have you, like you said, share uh, constructive views of that uh, has uh, the goal to change the narratives positively uh, across the African uh, continent. We are heading to uh, uh, Nigeria to meet uh, Mr. Ezengu Nwagu. He's joining in his capacity as uh, the Executive Director of Hearing Advocacy and uh, Advancement Center in Africa. Hello to you, sir, and a pleasure having you this day on the Pan-African debate. Clarice, well, good to have you. I hope the New Year is treating you well. Indeed, indeed. It is, of course, uh, treating us so well. And that's why we're here this day to continue to talk issues concerning the continent, the beautiful black continent, Africa. And uh, to Ghana, let's meet Mr. Ambi uh, Fokwa, joining in his capacity as indigenous cultural advocate. Hello to you, Mr. Ambi. A pleasure having you those days. It's good afternoon, Clarice. It is a pleasure to be once again on Africa Media. We'll be delving into this lovely topic of praising the value of democracy and elections, essentially in Africa, and how far it is going to take the development of our, is it, what is it, 54 countries, I think? Yes, yeah, so we'll be looking at the ones that are particularly having elections this 2023 year. So it's a pleasure to be here and one love to all of our viewers. And thank you for accepting to be with us. Uh, does the uh, Mr. Ambia in the minutes I heard, uh, Doctor or uh, Honorable Doctor Rashid Pebua will be joining us still uh, from uh, Ghana and in his capacity as MP for War Central and uh, ex Minister of uh, State and uh, Ghana. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. If you are just tuning in, this is uh, the Pan African debate. Do you think the pending elections? in some African countries this year 2023 stand a chance to redefine a new path for a democracy across Africa do they have the potentiality to transform Africa's democracy uh, Dr. Demancha I will start uh, with start off with you uh, let's understand uh, the concept of democracy uh, especially uh, in the contemporary uh, society as we seek to see if actually these elections are going to serve uh, as a litmus test for a democracy across Africa. Well, uh, Clarice, I would like to also look at exactly what democracy is and what it has come to be for Africa. Because democracy, as we call it, uh, has come to be perceived differently, even as it was conceived in Greece. You know, that is not exactly the way it is practiced even in America or in Europe. And therefore, democracy, as we welcome in Africa, uh, to me, personally, I think it, it was supposed to be put into an African context. Because if you want to practice democracy, as you call it, as it is done in America and Europe, there are a lot of parameters you have to take into consideration. But I would like to concentrate on what holds in Africa and what is supposed to be in Africa. Mm -hmm. I must say that we are coming in from the 1960s, we, 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 we came out from a very, very difficult period. Well, I would call it difficult because of what I see to be democracy to be today. Difficult because uh, we were, being ruled by monarchs, uh, you know, 
Uh, and in Africa, you didn't know what it means to vote a leader. We just knew that leaders were natural. You know, they just came from father to son and whatsoever. But now after the 1960s, when most Africans started having, African countries started having their independence, now we started welcoming that wind of change. And even then, it was not really when we call, talked about democracy. You know, after the democracy is not a long time ago in Africa. It was it started in the 1990s when we, we had the wind of change that blew from Eastern Europe right down here. And that is when we after started practicing what we call uh, democracy, you know. And, and that was when we had what we call the freedom of association, freedom of multipartism, and all of those. That's when uh, most leaders actually, hand, I mean, uh, openly embraced what we call democracy, and we have come to have it today in, in, in elections. But then, uh, democracy as a system of government, you know, is that which we, are, we replace the government through free and fair elections. I want to underline this. You replace the government through free and fair elections. But we are going to be asking some of these rhetorical questions, whether okay. in Africa, really, there is what we call the free and fair election before we are talking about democracy. Because if there is no free and fair elections in Africa, we will not be talking about democracy. Democracy also means active participation of the people as citizens in politics and civic life. I mean, we are asking ourselves, if Africans do not actively participate, if they do not actively participate you know, in politics, do we actually call this a democracy? Then there is a problem. Now, because, I mean, when we talk about participation in civic life and election, they what we call a right and a duty, you know, and we have to come to that. Democracy also means protection of the human rights of all citizens. Now we ask ourselves a question. During elections, and uh, the way democracy actually is, uh, I mean, you know, perceived in, in Africa, mm -hmm. is there a free, is there a protection of human lives as far as the practice of democracy is concerned? Now, and then I will go to this one, I will talk about democracy is a rule of law, meaning that what? That democracy is guided by law. And when we say guided by law, there's what we call freedom. You are only free under the law. You are free only under the law. And I mean, we look at these four parameters in talking about uh, 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 democracy. Now, you see, sometimes I would like to get into it because I, I started by saying that we copy some of those things and we apply them wrongly. wrongly. Yes, we really apply them wrongly in Africa. We, we have had uh, leaders in Africa who, are, who sit tight. You know, leaders in Africa who sit, and then we, we, there is what we call the framework, the constitution. You have a constitution, a leader is supposed to rule for two terms of four years. And uh, after the two terms of four years, the, the power becomes so sweet, and you know, you know the constitution is outrightly smashed. And then what we, we say here, like in some countries we have, there's not even no, no presidential term limit. Is this still democracy? This is just some of the question, the fundamental question we are supposed to ask. Him. But really, coming out from as a traditionalist, I would like to say that we perceive we received it wrongly. Because when we see Europe and America practicing what we call democracy today, it is because they have come from a very, very also a very, very tough past. You know, let me tell you that America was once a dictatorship. Europe was once a dictatorship. And I've known that they have gone through the, America is about 200 years independence. And coming up today and exercising that democratic right and as citizens taking politics, I mean, as a part of life. Because this is what it's supposed to be. Africans are supposed to take politics as part of their civic right and responsibility. It's not, it's not just like a pastime. Because in Africa, we take policy to be a pastime. It's not supposed to be a pastime. If it is democracy, it means that it is supposed to be active, not passive. And that we are supposed to actively take part in what is happening. But then, I understand that. Uh, sometimes, I made this statement in one of the media platforms, and I said, Africa is not right for democracy. Because we have tested it, at least for so many years we have tested it, and we are not yet right. We'll be coming back of to course, that. Of yes. course, we'll come back to that to really understand uh, the type of democracy that is actually suitable for the continent Africa, Africa. Uh, Dr. Demancher. And we're going to continue in the same perspective with you, uh, Mr. Uh, Ezenwar. Uh, in your own perspective, what do you perceive as democracy uh, in uh, the uh, contemporary Africa? 
we, we don't we want to analyze to look at what better suits for the continent Africa in in your own opinion what do you think is this democracy that we are looking uh, to, to strengthen as countries uh, head to the polls in the months ahead of course uh, your country Nigeria is the first to start the election calendar this year 2023 It's okay to look at uh, democracy uh, first, not just as Western democracy or uh, the type that we have. Um, Africa had uh, democracy. Africa had practiced democracy. So because even the definition of democracy is still a bit challenging for even scholars as we speak. So it depends on the part of the history of Africa that you are um, from which time you start reading the history of Africa in talking about um, democracy. So if the conversation is about West, the Western democracy that we are currently um, practicing, which uh, places a lot of premium on periodic elections um, and multi-party democracy, fundamental human rights, and such other, you know, um, if you like, uh, values that are, we are espousing, then uh, democracy is finding its root in, in Africa. And then there's the variant that is also tied to democracy that is tied to free trade, uh, that is tied to markets. So those those are currently going on. So, um, but the Western democracy must always be defined first and foremost by whether you have strong institutions, whether you have political parties, whether you're, you have free and independent electoral commission, um, and that is the electoral management body that is truly independent, uh, whether your judiciary can be said to be free, uh, free uh, judiciary. So um, Africa is beginning to see a, 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 a grips Fortunately, we lost uh, Mr. Zengwa. If uh, uh, you will be coming back to you subsequently uh, to get your own viewpoint uh, pertaining a uh, topic for discussion this day, I will uh, ride on with you, Mr. Ambi, uh, getting your own uh, uh, approach of how you see democracy in contemporary Africa and, of course, the expectations uh, as uh, countries so or with uh, water, African countries head to the polls. Uh, today, we are actually focusing on what we are call political democracy. We talk elections, we talk politics. Well, I just want to kind of um, piggyback on what my other panelists were saying when they began um, illustrating the definition of democracy. But I want to um, first say that actually, when we're just looking at this English term, which it is, whether it's coming from Britain, from the, the, the Queen's language or not, it shouldn't alter us or shift us from looking at the fact that the definition and meaning behind it is, it's, it's, it's fundamental to all cultures, essentially. When we're talking about um, democracy, if we want to even go to the etymology of the term from Greek, we're looking at um, two words. Um, one word is, uh, is it demos, the other is kratia. Demos, the people, kratia being the power. So you could come also to Africa in any context and reason that it is a system of government in which the people are actually aligned in some way to take uh, representation, to be participants in the administration of power or governance or um, just to throw out some examples even I know in most African societies we've transitioned from our um, traditional forms of governance even in the days of monarchies um, in Cameroon where they have traditional councils like the Kwifon uh, they have the Nui Long in some of the Tikari and Gemba cultures in Ghana also the, the chiefs they always have a type of traditional council which is structured around the person who might be called the Manse or the chief or the king of that traditional group now these traditional um, 
groups or councils are always made of representatives in the community. Certain elders of um, individuals who have aspired to become notable in the community always made up these councils, which were given the um, type of recognition of even being responsible for king making, essentially. So if we want to talk about democracy in terms of it having the characteristics of, um, we always define a democracy as being governance by people through elected representatives. Now we would see in the African context, there was that representation in the form of governance in the past from the traditional systems, which at one point then, um, some people will say it was positive. Um, me as an indigenous advocate, I will say you know, it's probably the greatest travesty in the history of our political evolution. We went from traditional systems which had accountability to the individuals, to the people of the particular ethnic groups, to the systems we are now following, which brought colonial political administration into our form of what you would call indigenous democracy. And before we've evolved, like one brother pointed out, I can't really explain it. We got to the transition of um, our own um, indigenous politics from colonial politics to getting being granted multiculturalism. All of these things showing the evolution through representation, through elections, through Africans indigenously selecting their leadership. So yes, um, I, 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 I say yes or no. I would say yes. Um, democracy has been transitioning us. Um, according to the, um, the topic we're talking about, is it strengthening democracy in Africa? Yes, it has been as that context and structure of allowing individuals their communities to be a part of their governance, like I pointed out. But when we want to talk about democracy being a process and not just the elections, when we get now to the post-election period, whether these this new form of democracy, post-colonial as it has come to us, whether it allows us to continue to have accountability, to maintain accountability and enforce responsibility to individuals who are now elected as our representatives, I think is the question that will really determine whether the democracy we have been evolving is truly effective. And if we start looking at that light, then we'll start to see some flaws in the way that we have implemented democracy because we lack a lot of checks and balances which would allow us to strengthen the power of our election, which is um, um, gives us the right to safeguard our vote. We don't have an independent judiciary where the executive can manipulate it and election results are then given contrary to what actual balloting and representation of people would have meant. That means that therefore our, dem our democratic process, it's evolving, but it's faulty in those areas of being implemented and accountability. So that's just how I want to start to look at the topic with my own uh, perspective. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ambi. And uh, just to tell the viewers uh, that they are most welcome to the Pan-African debate. And of course, uh, this is also an interactive program. Uh, in the, the minutes ahead, uh, you have the numbers on your screen where you can uh, uh, call and uh, participate to give your own opinion of what you think is uh, democracy uh, in uh, contemporary Africa. And of course, if uh, uh, the forthcoming or the upcoming elections across Africa will go a long way to define a, a new pattern of democracy in Africa or strengthen already existing democracy or democratic institutions across the continent of Africa. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Honorable Dr. Rashid uh, Pebwa uh, just joined uh, the panel right away. Uh, he is an um, MP, uh, uh, member of parliament for War Center and former uh, uh, minister of state joining from Ghana. Hello to you, Honorable. Thanks for joining us this day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, wish you the very best this new year and beyond. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting program we are listening to, and it's very key to the future of Africa. Data, it is key to the future of Africa when we analyze to what extent uh, elections uh, deliver on democracy. We also try to analyze and see how we can put an end uh, to political terrorists across Africa, which uh, is not actually favorable to the uh, growth of democracy or strengthening institutions across the continent of Africa. I will continue with you right away, uh, Honorable Dr. Rashid. Uh, you are, of course, member of parliament there in Ghana. Uh, we were looking at how uh, the, the pending elections uh, in the year 2023 across Africa will redefine uh, what we call democracy in uh, contemporary Africa. And of course, we will be glad that we get your own viewpoint on this uh, particular uh, subject, which is of utmost interest to us. Well, um, Africa has come a long way um, from where we got to which was referred to as the lost decade between the 1970s and 80s 
we had gone through a lot of turbulence after we had we after we liberated ourselves from the colonial regimes we ran through lots of coup d'etats lots of violent attacks on leadership and civil wars all across the continent you know with rebels climbing to the stage and taking power and all that and all that this brought africa to a lot of pain and we got to the late 1980s when we thought that look the alternative was to go for democracy so the late 90s when we went for democracy it was to say forget the past the past is gone now free choice is the area to go and so we decided that um we will make leadership emerge through free choice and that has been working for a while until there is a resurgence again of various coups and the disturbance of the political system but democracy as a whole if that is well will solve many of the uh, political uh, challenges africa has when people are given the choice to select a leader and the leader emerges they still have the power to push him aside or set him aside and so democracy is critical is crucial it gives people the forthright uh, of rightness to be able to move forward and backwards in how they want their leadership to emerge and it strengthens people's ability you know to dictate what they want but as we go along many many leaders begin to see democracy as an abstraction because they want to extend themselves beyond the limited period allocated to them for example why will anybody want to have a leadership uh, beyond the four term or five term allocated by the constitution. If you have that in mind, what you are telling people is that you want to extend yourself beyond your future and against the will of the people. And that's going to create a problem. For me, democracy as a free choice, a uh, system of free choice is very important. If we have to stop all these conflicts, if we have to stop people from being autocratic and being over exploitative and it enables us to resettle and um, have fear, you know, of the sovereign will of the people. The will that chooses them must be the will that also tells the, sets them aside. If we are able to set up a system where the will of the people predominates, you know, and supports the will or the supports the the, the 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 rule of law in whatever we do, then it means that Africa would have moved several. Uh, several kilometers or mile, miles into a system of progress. Unfortunately, in many countries, it's the same democratic systems they exploit to the point that you, you forget that you are in a democracy. I have seen in, in, in a place like um, Uganda, where people are, are malhandled because they are opposing their leaders. I've seen people in other countries like Rwanda, where leadership is so dominant that it becomes difficult for uh, people to get up and oppose, even though in Rwanda, admire them for whatever achievements they have made so far, excellent country. Um, you, you, you see in, in the places like North Africa, Central Africa, sorry, North Africa, and indeed Central Africa and um, you know other places where people definitely are not the ones that we want to see happen in our democracies. They impose themselves, they impose their will, and the people begin to fear that that's not the kind of democracy they want. So we need to begin to look at what kind of democracy we want in Africa. And we need to safeguard the constitution as we project it into the future. We need to make sure we enlighten the people so they don't become accomplices to individuals who want to destroy the system and who manipulate them and utilize them, their will, to their own advantage. I choose democracy. But I don't choose democracy that is manipulated by individual leaders. Which is very uh, imp uh, imperative, uh, Honorable Dr. Rashida. Uh, when we talk democracy, we are looking at uh, a scenario where the will of the people will count. I will come back to you, uh, Dr. Dimanjo. Uh, looking at uh, the, the definition of democracy and the viewpoint uh, that uh, uh, all of you just uh, presented uh, uh, right now, let's try to see how the existing governance systems across Africa actually are uh, strengthening 
political democracy. Can we say uh, we can, of course, uh, 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 give a, a top up uh, to the existing governance uh, systems across Africa and uh, the, the sustenance of democracy in Africa? Not at all. Not yet. But I know there's progress. Uh, this progress is uh, too slow, uh, as I see it. There's progress, but it is too, too slow. Uh, as I said earlier, democracy should actually be cultural. Yes, we can give all kinds of definitions of democracy, but it will never be exactly as it was practiced uh, by the Greeks or by the Greeks when it, they formulated it. And I think that we need to put it in the African context. And I want to look at a country like uh, Libya. Uh, do, most people do not know that Libya used to practice its own democracy they called the Jamiria. The Jamiria was a kind of democracy that was very unique to the Libyan people. And it was functioning for them. And some people came up, whatever by word, and said, no, this is dictatorship. Gaddafi must go. Gaddafi must go. And today I mock at those people. I have some friends. About, I mock at them because in that two, particular 2011, when they were clamoring for Gaddafi to go, oh, yeah. and I, I, today I ask them, look at Libya in dictatorship before 2011, mm -hmm. and look at Libya in democracy after 2011, and you tell me exactly which is democracy. You see, I tell people that democracy is the dictatorship of the few. Democracy is the dictatorship of the few. And therefore, sometimes you will not sit and say that this is actually the model of democracy. Democracy depends on how the people look at it. You see, and I usually say that demo every democracy seeks to preserve life. Every democracy should seek to preserve life. A democracy that does not preserve life is no democracy. And therefore, the people who value their lives Institutions that value the lives of their people are democratic institutions. You look at Europe and America, a single soul is very important. If an American dies in Africa, they make a whole hell of noise about it. They clamor for the soul that has been lost. But look at our own people. Millions or hundreds of thousands will die in crisis and conflict, and nobody will say anything about it. Our leaders are very, very comfortable about it. And those are the leaders who put the initials of, uh, I mean, democratic e e e e uh, names in their countries. You see, these are the very leaders who think that there is no life after the presidential palace. They think that once they are in the presidential palace, that is all about them. Once if they move out, life will stop for them. This is not democracy. And I want to look at the concept of democracy in terms of the individuals who incarnate that democracy and the institutions. I know about that, but the individ individuals, I've already talked about individuals who don't see life after the presidential palace, and we have to condemn that. If you don't see life after the presidential palace, it means that you cannot stand for a free and fair elections because you know that if you give free and fair elections, if you give, I mean, that condition for free and fair elections, you will not have another mandate. And that's why we keep on increasing mandates and actually canceling presidential term limits. And we keep on saying, this is a very good leader. And I say to Africans, and I say it every day, there is no successful leader without a successor. There is no successful leader without a successor. If you think that you are the only one that is fit to rule a country, it means that you are not a successful leader. And we have to change the dynamics. You know, there are candidates who react violently to a re election result. I mean, they are not ready to take anything that is negative. And I think that democracy is about service. Democracy is about service. Serving selflessly and serving and accepting to lose. Once you do not accept to lose, I don't think that you will create any institution that would give room for another leader to come and take over you to, tomorrow. No, you have leaders who refuse to accept defeat. If you refuse to accept defeat, it means that even the constitution, which of course you stand to defend can never stand for a free and fair election and that's why you keep on appointing election election observers who are your friends who are your family members and those who can be able to change 
you know what i mean the, the institutions have put you see there are leaders who refuse who, who use violence to hold on to power if we use violence to intimidate people to hold on to power i don't think that you can form on any institution that will be for a free and fair election not the election uh, dispute all over the place all over africa conflicts all over africa and even though we the coup d'etats have reduced and i've said they have reduced but not really as we wanted you still see that there are a lot of conflicts in africa Thank now you. let me go to institutions you know they, 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 i mean ele elections have become that a necessary do or die kind of situation where politicians have been doing all the, i mean politicians want to use all the means you know it's a do or die thing either i win or somebody's life is lost and i tell africans no blood no single drop of blood of an african is worth your ambition no single blood, drop of blood of an African is worth your ambition. If you think that you can spill blood in order to gain power, means that you are not going to serve the people. You are going to serve yourself. And I've always compared leaders, real leaders, to a pelican. That bird, they call the pelican. You know, it is that bird that wounds itself to feed his young. If you are not, if you don't measure yourself to that bird, they call the pelican, means that you are not fit to be actually a leader in Africa. And you know, we, we have these electionary languages that are increasingly becoming insightful and violent. You know, well, during elections, you find people give, I mean, because elections now is according to tribes, according to villages, according to regions, now they are using words now to describe the different tribes. It yes. is no more an integral thing that concerns the whole country. It is about the, the winner takes it all. It's about people drawing the blanket to themselves, and that is what we are declining. The, those who are left to, I mean, no, those who lose an election in Africa are left to rule or, or, or are treated as enemies of the government. They are not supposed to be enemies of the government. When, if you are a presidential candidate and you had maybe 5,000 people behind you and another person wins with 2 million people, let that, the winner know that he needs the 5,000 people in order to govern the country. No, you cannot treat your opponents as enemies and they keep on being, they, they are constantly under threat because you are feeling uncomfortable to form an integral government. You know, democracy is something that people, I mean, you argue, you advance points, and when your point is not taken, you take the point of the, I mean, of your opponent. And that is how it is practiced in Europe and America. But in Africa, we saw something. We have, I mean, we cannot talk about the weak uh, electoral institutions. I mean, they are very weak, and we are going to be discussing this uh, clearly. As, as, in in yes. detail, Dr. Devancher, you've actually highlighted uh, so many areas uh, uh, where we need to focus uh, as far as wanting to sustain or to, to take a, a different turn when it comes to democracy across uh, the continent, Africa. And uh, let me come to you, Mr. Ambia. Uh, we talked about, uh, uh, we're looking at uh, democracy. And you, as a, uh, a cultural or an indigenous cultural advocate, let's look, Mr. Uh, Dr. Demancho, while talking earlier on, mentioned something which I want, uh, like you, to capitalize on democracy is culture. And there is this, uh, 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 I, I've forgotten his name, but then uh, this uh, uh, African who shared his viewpoint, at, and he was categorical and said, without elections, there is still, or there will exist a very strong and better uh, democracy across Africa. Do you share this uh, viewpoint, taking it from the cultural perspectives, trying to inculcate such cultural values that fits just in the African context, and of course, defining its own democracy from those tenets, cultural tenets? Well, the way I would answer this question, Clarice, I would begin by saying, it's the benevolent despot um, complex. I think that's what it is. Uh, there's a paradox in which, because Africans, like our, um, like the doctor first started pointing out, we've actually evolved from um, a traditional monarchical form of government that went that actually went through colonization and then adopted a lot of Western trappings and its own cultural presentation of governance. So we Africans actually are more used to indigenously having a leader who was not actually elected, but who we were able to gain 
um, representation through by our local councils. I started pointing out that we had the elders and those type of groups that then could represent the community as far as the community heads were, and then approach the king or the manse or the chief or whoever, the fund who was acting over a particular ethnic group. Now, this is more of a traditional way of government. I wouldn't say it's necessarily our culture, because um, the, the culture of governance all over Africa, we talk of 54 countries, each country might have maybe 150 to 200 ethnic groups or tribes. So each ethnic group or tribe or ethnic nation is going to have its own tradition of how it would have passed down its authority and forms of um, governance from one regime to the next, essentially. But because we still have this mentality of looking at leadership like it's um, traditionally valid through that monarchical lens of this family, this particular individual has divine rights, this person cannot be questioned essentially once they've been put in leadership, it finds us now having difficulty post colonial um, governance essentially because it's the forms of colonial governance that now have brought in this idea that a lot of people will call western democracy that i wanted to stay away from the concept that um broad representation being selected by the people is something that is purely western that it's, it's a purely caucasian concept and when i started talking about even greece um, and its um, etymology with its definition of the word democracy is because Greece um, formulated the Senate. And um, the Senate in its concept is something that also goes back to Egypt, ancient Kemet, um, even like I said, back to our ethnic structures, the idea of that representation through um, individuals or elders who speak on behalf of the community. Now, how we come around into a circle to be able to actually balance this transitional logic that now the people see why they are actually participating in the system of governance through elected individuals such that they are able to hold the prime leader, the, the, who would be the fun, who now actually is um, the president, essentially. If we want to say the kings in the um, traditional structures of African governance now are represented actually by a president who is elected by the universal suffrage of the people, each individual having a right to have some say in that. Um, our population hasn't gotten that, that, that circle in logic to understand the value and the power of what they have, such that they are easily coaxed and tricked in, in st into not going for, I mean, literally, the, the, the best of two evils would be to have a benevolent dictator, like the situation doctor started pointing out in um, Libya. Um, a lot of people frown upon the fact that Muammar Gaddafi, I think, um, he was prime leader, president of Libya from uh, 1961 to 2011, that's about 50 years. But the mandate and the way Libya was governed was um, what we discovered only after the coup d'etat, which was led by um, NATO and France in the forefront. Um, we, we saw the failure of a system that offered free health care to its citizens, um, that offered free loans for uh, development of housing projects, uh, free grants. Um, all of this was under someone who would have been said to be a dictator said to have evolved out of the traditional monarchical despotic systems of traditional government that we Africans say we're supposed to be getting away from in Britain democracy. But he was able to give his country so much in that position of being able to maintain power. And that paradox now starts to formulate because we have our democratic systems, which have existed from independence till now, um, while Libya would have been considered this benevolent despotic empire or um, regime that have not actually been able to give their citizens the same social uh, benefit, the, the, the same free grants to do business, the same infrastructure. So people, I mean, as, as individuals, Indians are continent, trying to reason how these systems can merge. This is the conflict that we're having. And if we can look into it and see that in one way or another, a good leader has a long mandate who is able to implement what people see in democracy, the, the, the freedom of expression, um, the, the free trade, you see, the, the social amenities. This is a good thing. This is a, a positive leader if we want to talk in terms of what would be African culture. The leaders that instead are elected by popularity contests, which can manipulate political party structures and then don't deliver the goods to the people are actually bad leaders. And people need to understand that it's their vote based on looking at the track records of each individual in whichever country is what actually determines whether that person is capable of doing what they were expected. All of this comes post the election, but it's the people knowing the value of their vote in a democratic structure that are able to decide. I hope that we can look at things like that. Maybe that it helps us kind of get a logic of how we can deal with this um, benevolent, despot uh, paradox that we have on the African continent. 
uh, in uh, Mr. Alia, it's uh, always uh, imperative uh, to take a critical look. Uh, coming uh, to you, the Honorable Dr. Rashid, uh, let's look at, we cannot talk about sustaining uh, democracy, and of course, we feel to, to analyze uh, or to look at those uh, uh, factors that actually uh, drill uh, the uh, uh, sustenance of democracy in Africa. We are looking at power alternation in Africa. So let's look at uh, how uh, uh, elections uh, transform the the, power, the alternation of power in Africa, and of course, how this is helping to sustain democracy. Because, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Demancher mentioned uh, the fact that uh, uh, the, 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 there's the issue of, you know, uh, leaders who do not respect the, the term limit who will alter constitutions in order, of course, to stay in power, and of which, which is actually a setback to democracy across Africa. So let's relate uh, power alternation and how elections will actually foster uh, or, or, and promote the, the patterns or change the patterns of power alternation and how this is actually a plus to sustaining democracy across the continent. Well, thank you so much. The whole concept of democracy is to enable a transition of power from one end to the other, from one person to the other, to create a situation where there's no confusion and conflict as to who the leader and at what time his leadership or her leadership will come to an end. Through democracy, the free choice of people, uh, it enables a nation, especially in Africa, to change leadership by taking up arms, you know, and away from the perpetration of power in the hands of one person who evaluates that the state belongs to them. Unfortunately, the challenge we have in that practice of democracy is that we have not been able to transit what we learn from the European system into an African system adopted with an African mentality so that our culture, our understanding of it can give more meaning into how we choose our leaders and how we exit out of power. So we build institutions that look like the European institutions. We practice those institutions. We are able to without necessarily looking at the critical role in the lives of um, our people and in the total conception of democracy. It's important that in democracy, people are free to make choice. But it's also important that in democracy, people understand what they are doing and that the people cannot be used to attack themselves. In today, I, I saw a video in which uh, um, the, the, the Cameroonian president, former Cameroonian president, you know, is taken to a function. He didn't know what function it was. He is so old that he didn't understand what was happening. He was there, you know, listening out there and, and talking in such a manner, the impression that he was new to the place. And he asks, who are these people? Are they accountable? It means you don't even know why. Now, how can a people agree to select such a person at an international conference? That is the point I'm saying that if people are not enlightened, they become an enemy to themselves, even in democracy. So free choice must be followed by enlightened understanding and properly instituted institutions that guard the people and guard the system. I, I, I think that culture is important in this direction, as the, um, my, my friend has just said, because in culture, it is possible for you to, under, to, to, to understand the years of building a psychology, a psychology to appreciate the present. If you want to use what you have been built with to address what they, the challenge you have is that you are unable to move forward because all the time you see yourself drifting forward because you, you, you get back to understand. You get back to a culture which does resemble the existing structures. So I, I think that um, African democracy is good. Uh, so far, it enables Africans um, to make choices. It enables us to uh, come out of a situation of um, you know, people who are existentially feeling that they are the ones to rule. It enables us to make a choice and to be able to change leadership, except for leaders who, by the people themselves, become uh, difficult to remove perpetuate themselves in power and tend to abuse the people. 
I will cite an example again as uh, in, in I will cite an example of Malawi where Banda was there, didn't want to go away. You cite the examples of Zimbabwe where he stayed and stayed on and kept saying the people who choose him. Everywhere else, you know, you can find these leaders who plan themselves and are unable to move and makes democracy look like, well, it doesn't matter at all. It's not the, the reason we are, we are putting you there. So the individual feeling, the self-consciousness, you know, of individuals who make a choice must be, must be strengthened so that we, 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 we go beyond the fact that we fear our leaders. We go beyond the fact that we can say no to leaders, even when we support them and they go wrong. You know, we, we insist that these are our countries and these are the things we want to happen, that we want to see happen in our countries. We want to make it clear that Africans have left behind for so long and we need to change circumstances. We need to move away. We need to be strong enough. We need to be, we need to fight, you know, to be ourselves. Away from the present situation of luck and you see our people running away into the country, dying in seas, you know, and, and, and in deserts because they want to leave Africa. It's all because of leadership failure. And we need to change. It's very important. And democracy is a choice for us, except that we have to indigenize it and we have to make it work for us. Uh, Honorable Dr. Rashid, uh, uh, just to reiterate, uh, of course, people cannot be used to attack themselves, uh, the words of Honorable Dr. Rashid. And of course, uh, Mr. Zenwe just uh, uh, joined us eh? As, uh, after uh, the uh, uh, interruption. Let me uh, ride on with you, sir. Uh, we are actually uh, uh, analyzing uh, to what extent uh, uh, elections in Africa will meet uh, or sustain or strengthen uh, democracy. So, but then let's look at this aspect. Do you think the existing electoral system across Africa are the best? And of course, do you think they meet the aspirations of Africans? I think more and more. Uh, sorry, I had to. I had to go off. I had some technical issues. Um, I think more and more, um, most of Africa is embracing the infliction of technology into the electoral process. Uh, Nigeria is um, um, almost getting to that point where it has a, a bimodal uh, system. That is uh, where manual is working hand in hand with uh, technology. Um, but all of that said, I, I think uh, the last, uh, the last uh, panelist made a point about the fact that democracy, whether it is electoral, uh, must work for the good of the people. Uh, all over the world right now, there's a debate as to whether um, democracy is working for the majority of citizens or not. Um, so. The, the fact of the matter is that um, in Africa, we need to make a choice between whether we want to practice democracy or we want to practice a civilianized form of dictatorship. Civilianized in the sense in which poverty, hunger, disease, disempowerment, lack of infrastructure has disempowered the people to the point even when they are voting, even when they are standing up to vote you need to really be clear whether they are voting their choice and their conscience. Because in most of African countries, um, individuals have become governments. They are the ones providing for majority of their people. The schools, if you, where they have schools, they are not free. And if they are not free, if people have to pay, a majority of your citizens are not able to pay for education. And there are individuals who, because of their connection to the state, become alternative governments in those environments. They are now the ones who uh, eventually play roles of government. And so uh, even when you have people queuing up all over Africa, especially in the country to vote, yeah, you, you need to be clear whether those people really are within their, their choice. So it's not about what, what, what has been introduced. Like I said, technology, there's a fetish making a ceremony of beavers in Nigeria right now. And uh, how beavers will improve the credibility of the election? It will. But at the end of the day, people own those polling units. Polling units are owned. Owned in the sense that uh, in Nigeria, when you see politicians talk, they say 
go and I don't know whether that is what it is in other places. They say, deliver your polling unit. They tell, they tell politicians, they say, deliver your polling unit. When they say, deliver your polling unit, what do they really mean? Why should they, an individual be the one to deliver his polling unit if people will make free choices? So I, I was talking about the need for, um, importantly, strong political parties. Um, the term party democracy within the political parties are, are weak in the sense that most of what you have is also in those political parties. They are not democratic. So the leadership recruitment machine with the political parties ordinarily should be have not been able to uh, you know play that role in a way that guarantees these choices that um, we are talking about so what kind of political parties are we having in africa are we having political parties in which there are truly members or in which there are deep pockets who support who fund the parties are the government uh, the government in power are they using resources from the states to fund those political parties. Are political parties, people paying membership dues in these political parties in a way that they can raise their stakeholders uh, within these political parties. So if you have political parties that have been hijacked by uh, executives in most of these African countries, uh, especially in which even founding um, the people in my country, for instance, somebody wakes up in the morning, is a member of uh, a political party, in the evening has joined another one. The fluidity of that movement uh, makes a mockery of, of um, the idea of a strong um, political party. Then the issue around independent electoral movement uh, in many of the African countries, the nature of the nature of the appointments uh, is, is anything but independent. In many of the African countries, their finances, their funds are still tied to the April strings of the executive. And then um, in many cases, you know that uh, he who pays, even when they tell you that um, they are now, um, they, like in my country, they tell you they are on first line charge. Um, but the, the nature of the appointment makes it difficult for members of the commissions to actually expose challenges when they have one. Because at the end of the day, they, they have loyalties that are beyond them, you know, that are not loyalty to the people. So if you do not have independent um, electoral management bodies, you don't have strong political parties, and your judiciary is still uh, a weak. Uh, it's, it's just um, a match to more improvement. That's, that's the way I'll see it. I'll be thinking that um, African democracy is on a course of improvement and that different stakeholders have responsibility and have rules to play to deepen it. Um, for us to be able to have a, you know, political culture, it means that we must make democracy work for people in a way that those who are challenging democracy will have no argument. Uh, if water is not running for the majority of people, if the schools are not functioning for them, if there is no health provisioning everywhere, if the security and lives and properties of citizens are not guaranteed, at the end of the day, they will begin to worry about kind of when uh, you are practicing. So, but all in all, I think it pays Africa to be democratic. It pays Africa not to have one one party state. It pays Africa not to have uh, an individual consistently being uh, in government for 20, 15, 10 years. I think periodic elections is important. And then as we test these systems, we, we, we begin to strengthen them. That, that will be my uh, contribution for now. And of course, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Uh, Ezenwa Mwago. Thank you for your analysis uh, pertaining our topic for discussion. Just to remind our viewers uh, that uh, uh, they have the opportunity to also call and share uh, their own opinions uh, regarding our topic this day. And of course, the numbers, you have the numbers on your screen already. You can call uh, your WhatsApp and uh, uh, participate. What do you think uh, 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 is the state's of democracy across the continent Africa and do elections fully deliver on democracy uh, if you are just joining us this is uh, the pan-african debate and you uh, must uh, welcome uh, we're going to ride on with the analysis uh, Dr. Uh, Demancher when we talk about democracy we think about rule of law and of course we also think about the will of the people and of course those elements that democracy actually bring uh, to the people we're talking about things 
things like uh, the freedom of uh, speech, free press, decent work, peace, job and food security, among others. While talking earlier, you made mention that about the crisis rocking the African continent, which are actually uh, uh, an indication. Uh, that there is still a, a, a great uh, setback as far as democracy is uh, concerned. So with all of these things uh, that we just mentioned, free press, uh, freedom of speech, jobs and everything, what do you think uh, is the state of affair at, at this particular moment and how uh, our leaders, our political leaders, are actually working towards ensuring this and of course sustain sustaining uh, the democratic institutions. Yes, uh, in Africa, we have come to distinguish between two types of people when we, it comes to elections. And, uh, there's what we call those who are at the level of authority and those at the level of solidarity. Those who are at the level of authority are what we would call the politicians, the mainstream leaders of every country. And those at the level of solidarity are the ordinary citizens, of course, who vote in elections. Uh, let me tell you, elections is just a parameter because we are not God to determine exactly who is the right person. Mm -hmm. Because if God was with us, if God were with us, he would be able to determine and say that, no, uh, this particular person is going to be the best leader. Like we hear in the Bible, King Solomon and all the rest, they were good leaders. If God were with us, he would be able to tell us exactly. But election is just a parameter for us to use uh, to be able to discern uh, in our own limited knowledge who can be a better leader. Okay. And, and let me quote uh, uh, a leader. Uh, I want to quote Ariel Sharon, who once said, the whole world can be wrong. The whole world can be wrong. Meaning that even in what we call democracy, a whole mass of people can be wrong in choosing a leader. Okay. So we have to take this into consideration. It's very, very important. It is not because maybe a leader has had 99.999 percent that we have in africa that that leader is the best leader yes so we need to be very careful on that and that is why i keep on i mean i keep on talking about our cultural backing of what we are doing because i'm one of those people who believe that in africa we have consciences we have consciences and that when you want to do something for people you do it well and you use a conscience and you serve the people and serve them well uh, in Africa, we, at least we still have, we, we, usually we note some of these some countries who are still, at least, who are improving in what we would call the African way of democracy. Mm -hmm. and, and usually we look at some Anglophone countries, uh, I mean, like Ghana, you know. Of course, yeah, democracy is improving. When you look at some of these Anglophone countries, at least you see that uh, there is this constant, uh, you know, change. I mean, elections actually is something that is worth it. I'm not anyway a fan of a pe people who would say that they want change at all costs. Change at the helm of the state must not come at all costs. I want to underline one by at all costs. It must not come at all costs. Because to me, it is not really changing president all the time that actually makes the difference. What makes the difference is putting the president who is on seat on the balance with all his manifestos and striking the balance. This is actually what, what, we, what we look at. But then, you see that the crisis that is rocking Africa is uh, generated uh, by, by some people. And it is generated with a purpose. And now you understand that this purpose yields fruit. When it comes to elections, Africans, those at the level of solidarity, they you do not use their minds to vote. They do not use their consciences to vote. They use their situations to vote. And that is where the problem is. Can you imagine an African, those who are living in abject poverty, and they are being proposed during election, they are being proposed very minimal uh, compensations. And you know that you are in abject poverty. And because you think you cannot sacrifice, and continue to sacrifice, you fall in. I mean, you take those proposals. And so you, you see that in Africa, elections is like a show. A show, yes. It is like a spectacle. Election is a show that is being out of the plate by the protagonists and they are the politicians. The politicians are up there and now they see the citizens are just down here watching. The politicians are those people who have stolen the state money and they are using that very money to corrupt the people. And one way in which they corrupt the people is that they cause a lot of division. 
And I don't want to talk about in the Western world, those who come behind to be able to cause this havoc that is happening in Africa for their selfish gains. But I'm looking at the politicians who are our own brothers and sisters who promise us that when we shall get out of this colonialism, out of this change by the Western world, we are going to serve you better. Mm -hmm. I know there is Mbungi Wachongo in our Mari 101 who says, I ran away from cold land just to cover myself in frost land. You know, you see that Africans, they thought that they were getting to that El Dorado, but they have just discovered that they are getting back to the worst. And you see Africans who downrightly say that when they are voted, this is what they are going to do. But immediately they get into power, they, it is the very thing that they tend to do. They are the chitidos of our Yim Ama, of the beautiful ones and the year born. So I think that we are, there is poverty, which is a, a great cause of what is happening in Africa. In Europe, we do not have it. In Europe, you will not be talking, like America, for example, you don't talk about poverty. There is no, there's, uh, there's social insurance. You don't talk about health care. There's social insurance. There's health insurance. But in Africa, we don't have that. So in Europe, you don't have this voter apathy, this, this thing that we're in Africa. So you actually find that election is actually a competition that everybody is involved, the free conscience. But in Africa, we do not have free consciences to vote. We vote, for the most part of it, we vote those that we even hate to rule us. Mm -hmm. And these are some of the things that we're exhibiting in Africa that we are decrying. You know, we, we have corrupt officials who steal money and because they want to shield, they want to cover the corrupt practices, they use that money again to buy electorals to vote them so that they continue to rule uh, the people in corruption. So leadership, in one way, you see that it's imposed. I mean, it's, it's there, by, by it's conditional. So political parties are defending their vote. And, then, you know, and we also talk about the rule of election commissions. The rule of elections commission. In, in the Western world, you will not be talking about, in Africa, for example, in Cameroon. In Cameroon, they will say that uh, uh, political parties, you should be able to put your, your, your members, the militants, to defend your vote in all el electoral I mean, uh, 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 stations. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is supposed to be because we have what we call the electoral commission, that is, that is their job. This is to say that a political party that doesn't have militants enough to put in all police stations, he should be sure that the elections will be stolen. And this is not what's supposed to hold. What is the rule of the electoral commission? The electoral commission is supposed to defend the vote of all the parties. But then, the electoral commission that is being appointed by the, par the person in power normally is supposed to serve, are there to serve the people who are in power. So, there are a lot of things that come between, and you ask me, really, what is the way forward for all of this? Okay. The way forward for all of this is just that we Africans, we Africans, we have to come out of it. It is like, you know, when the, the uh, Sedat the Hall and Amir Cezaire and Contrast Damas, they were coming out with what we call the negritude, and they were giving their experiences of why they came out with what we call the, 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 the negritude. I think that we have to come back to that and, and say that we have a need of something. There are people who are mocking on us. Instead of the white world mocking at some of these early writers and early uh, 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 Africans, uh, uh, I mean, we are today faced with our own brothers and sisters who are the politicians, who are the little few at the level of authority, who are mocking at us. And I think that the point for the Africans, it is to rise up and rise up honestly. Do not rise up like the Pan-Africanists that I described today. Those Pan-Africanists that stand to defend the interests of Africa, but cause all their lives lived in Europe and they die in Europe. I think that we need to defend the African battles and defend it vehemently. That is the way forward. That, of course, we do not have... We, we, I mean, you don't concentrate on what you have to eat today. You should be able to ask questions. When the a minister tells you, I'm going to build hospitals, and... I mean, the next, I mean, it's find the minister who falls in and has a small surgery and he finds himself in Switzerland and he goes for surgery in Switzerland and he's promising you that you should stay in Africa. I'm going to provide hospital. You should ask us a question. Why is that man, why is the minister going to Switzerland for a small surgery? It means that he knows that their country is not best for you and certainly you should know that that minister is not good for you. When the president spends about three quarter of his time abroad, it's because he doesn't like the country. It means that the, the citizens, they have to take the country to the citizens, they have to rise up. And I usually say, and I've said again, I said, we all have to be pelicans. You don't have to eat today and forget about tomorrow. Do not enjoy Christmas and forget the minute Sunday. We have to be pelicans. We have to rise up through to ourselves. True to the African values. Those are just, the Africans are, you, are those who are used to fighting. The issue of capitalism has come and spoiled us. The issue of money. You talk about money, we cannot resist the issue of money. But if we want to stay true to ourselves, 
then we have to come back to our African values. In Peter, Africans need to be intentional about transforming the continent of Africa, uh, like you rightly underlined, uh, uh, Dr. Dementia. Uh, earlier on, now we talked about uh, uh, the issue of uh, accountability and transparency, which relates also uh, uh, to showing how, uh, to what extent, uh, there is democracy in uh, Africa. Uh, Mr. Ambe, let me come with, uh, to you. We, we talk about uh, uh, elections, and when we think of elections, we also think of uh, the process of actually uh, where politicians or uh, uh, leaders vying for political uh, positions crisscross the countries uh, vying for votes. But then let's look at to what extent these politicians meet their electoral promises and how far they deliver on the principles of accountability and transparency, which according to, uh, of course, uh, some pundits will go a long way to showing to what extent the continent has advanced in democracy. It's not just about elections, but then how accountable are our political leaders to the citizens? What a lot of our other panelists were saying, the lack of accountability is stemming from the fact that we don't have an independent judiciary, which actually can back any electoral commission to guarantee that if the executive, which is now going to be where the current ruling party administration is, is not actually capable of manipulating the entire electoral process. That is a very serious conflict that we are having. And the only way that it can actually be preserved, to tell you the truth, it would be by some radical form of uprising from the population with a desire to protect their votes, clearly. So I'm just going to be honest. If we don't have citizens who are educationally empowered to truly see that need, at one point to stand up to defend the polling stations where their vote has been tallied, then it'll be impossible. We, we've seen situations all over the country where elections got to the point of um, Supreme Court, which it was down to a single individual sitting, whether the election had truly gone in favor as per the vote counting, showed that there were irregularities and a grand possibility of an opposition party coming to take over a position where ruling party regime had, had been dominating. And we see that that Supreme Representative always in that whole mixture of lack of checks and balances, essentially, as they stated in um, what should be the prime democratic structure that we should be following, it's, it's totally violated. So if we're not going to have now transparent forms of um, electoral <sighs> monitoring to also back the citizens when they're taking this position to defend their polling, then it's also going to be another uh, complication. Um, I openly spoke about um, technology now coming into the electoral landscape in um, the African um, political milieu. And I think this is something that should really be exploited. When we have elections, journalists, um, our media professionals should make sure that they are at, at hand at the polling stations. They should be able to tally the immediate closing electoral result from the polling stations, and they should be able to centralize it to their um, media houses. Um, the political parties also should have in, individuals also in the same polling, and the national monitors are in. They should be able to compare their data to be sure that what comes out from the electoral commission, even if it does have appointed officials who might favor the executive, they should be able to truly transparently confirm that everything does synchronize. And where it does not synchronize, it comes down to that realization that we need to realize that we have an inherited political structure that through colonialism, a lot of our leaders are not actually representing the will of the people, just like um, our, as I think it was should have been um, Dr. Dimancho was uh, pointing out, essentially. African states, as we know them today, were formed as colonies. We just say colonies, but we don't understand that the European countries that came to Africa and partitioned ethnic nations, all of our tribes, as they used to be called, before the term ethnic nations, were grouped now into colonies that represented the economic exploitation value inherent for the colonial administrations. Meaning that if they came to a place like Ghana, and it was called the Gold Coast, Britain decided to exploit Ghana because it had a large proliferation of gold as a natural resource that it could use to build up its own economy as a metropole away from that um, continent away from the indigenes who should be benefiting from the value of that wealth. So we've gone into what is now called the um, neo-colonial era, which we would assume that 
we have total political administration and control of our government, that the leaders we are electing through this non-traditional monarchical system, which should represent the broad representation of the people, picking their elected representatives, these governments that are being formed now out of the colonial era actually are made up by individuals who represent an aristocracy that favored the former colonial regime. So when we carry our ballots to the election and we don't pay attention to what these parties and individuals are doing, not what they are saying, because when election time is coming, they will tell you they will drop taxes. They will talk about road infrastructure. They are talking about. They will talk about hospitals and free education and all of those things. They will talk about. But post that period, we have to pay attention to which contracts are actually implemented and whether employment is able to be improved in country. Whether we're able to actually see the use of the natural resources, the wealth derived from it, to actually increase the infrastructure in the country, or do we see small pocket projects and then more loans taken from the IMF, which again put us back in that colonial loop of we are creating, we are a country that's created that old debt that has its resources being plundered out with a little puppet group managing it. And then they continue to share contracts and position things like cocoa exploitation. They continue to make sure that the electrical exploitation, all of these things are maintained in companies that continue to give the predominant value of what should be left with us instead going out of the country. This is what our people have not understood. Their ballot actually is supposed to be controlled. You always want to go for the ruling party that has transitioned from colonialism or those major pundits that came out of those parties that were big talkers and started their own opposition parties that still are orbiting around the ruling party, which is actually still orbiting around the old colonial system. You have to be able to truly look at your leadership in the eyes of, are you able to give the goods? If you're speaking a different rhetoric, are you someone who is detached from the old aristocratic neo-colonial system that keeps perpetuating us in this situation? such that if I'm going to stand to be sure to want to defend my vote at the ballot, I'm not actually taking that value and giving it to someone who's just now a, a different form of the same old puppet master system. If we don't just lay it out there and see it as clear as that, then we haven't mastered the understanding of the African geopolitics that keeps us in this situation perpetually over and over. Every four to five years, we sit down and analyze once again how far democracy has taken our African states. But if we're not analyzing democracy in the context of, is it actually us as Africans, indigenous Africans, controlling our elected officials? Whether you call it African democracy or it's learned from the West or what, are we actually able to control our elected officials through the ballot? by holding this level of accountability, by first understanding why we should be, what's really at stake. Not the fact that maybe my uncle is in the ruling party and him being elected will help me to maybe have my daughter put in a civil servant tree place when she's of valuable age, like many people are thinking. Looking in the context of whether it's not about the ethnicity and the value that I get through supporting someone in the system, but whether the individual and the party system as a whole, with me being that individual, is actually seeing the infrastructural changes and implementation of policy that these people keep talking about. You shouldn't be tribalism in the forefront. It shouldn't be selling your ballot like we're hearing is a really, really big problem in Nigeria, even other countries. It should be that esteem to know that your ballot truly does change the way your nation and country is actually operated if you decide to not sell it. Indeed, uh, Mr. Uh, Ambi, uh, thank you for, for, for the great insight uh, uh, to that question. Uh, uh, let me uh, come to you, uh, uh, Mr. Ezenwe. Uh, let's, Mr. Ambi talked about uh, geopolitics. And of course, sometimes we want to ask if Africa is trapped uh, in the web of geopolitics across the country, but we are looking at elections, how they can sustain democracy. But there's this aspect which I want us to analyze and see to what extent it is also drilling uh, the process of democracy across Africa. Let's look at election financing because you know during the election periods we see candidates and uh, you can attest uh, uh, that uh, it is actually costly to run an election across africa so the, uh, during election periods you see political contenders uh, crisscrossing of course uh, 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 seeking for, for financing and of course we centralize now on the issue of election financing in Africa. And how do this, of, uh, uh, this aspect of election uh, financing, uh, can we say, uh, or is it crass to say that uh, this aspect alone is a setback to democracy or the path to democracy across Africa? Election financing, democracy, how can we correlate the two? 
Mr. Ezenwe, if you are here uh, with us, the, answer, the question is directed to you. Please, can you activate uh, your mic, uh, Mr. Ezenwe? Sorry, sorry. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Sorry. I can yeah, hear so, you. Yeah. Okay, I think that um, first is the Western democracy is expensive because of uh, the nature of um, of the process. Uh, you have to run through, if you are standing for election, you have to, in some countries, you have to run through your political party primaries. And uh, in, in, in our own environment, most times, uh, the nature, whether it is direct primary or indirect primary, um, money plays a lot of role in that. And uh, many political parties also um, ask candidates or aspirants to pay uh, some money. They start with what you call expression of interest form, and then eventually uh, for certain positions, um, an amount is uh, determined that you have to pay to be able to, to, be able to contest those uh, positions. So um, it links for me that what is in contention is the obscene use of money. And there are legal regimes that have been seen as to um, how much can be spent and what then will be uh, illegal. When elections, a uh, issue around election financing is very difficult to track. Because uh, in big countries like Nigeria and, uh, and some other African countries, uh, ordinary advertising alone consumes uh, quite a lot of resources. So it will be to look at those thresholds and ensure that the electoral management body have the capacity to track and to regulate, if possible, those who are going overboard. Having said that, I think that um, it's important to address some of the issues that we have been dealing with uh, before I, I run, which has to do with basically the issue of the elite ideology, what is the ideology of the African elite. Many times there is no difference between the position government and the opposition in terms of their understanding, in terms of their ideas about how to govern their countries. Many of them are still tied to the airplane swings of the IMF and the World Bank. Many of them have got autonomous economy. And we can extrapolate as much as we want on, you know, uh, electoral financing and all the rest of them. As far as this democracy is not working for the majority of African people, the challenge of deepening and consolidating democracy will still be a challenge. And we must continue to make the point that civic groups and organizations need to take over the narrative. We can't allow politicians to continue to have glossy uh, manifestos, uh, promises that are meant not to be kept, and civic groups and organizations and the media are not reorganizing the conversation in a way that it centralizes the need of the people and their concerns. And that, for me, will be a huge challenge that Africa faces going forward, even after this uh, um, ritual of elections that we will be having this year. Because at the end of the day, whether you go to Ghana or you go to Nigeria, you go to Sierra Leone and Gambia and the rest of Africa, poverty is working on Forex. Hunger and disease still have the majority of the citizens. There is absolute lack of infrastructure. And so um, the debate about what form of government will not continue to make any meaning to the ordinary people, except we re-engineer this democracy to become useful for the majority of the citizens. Indeed, a very imperative, Mr. Ezenwa. Uh, it, it is always uh, important for the ordinary people to understand because uh, uh, during elections, they cast their ballot. And of course, they should be educated about uh, uh, choosing the right leader and of course, seeing that the leader meets the expectations or the aspirations of the young people in Africa in the years to come. We do not want to talk about poverty. We want to talk about uh, a, 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 a living standard that is favorable and that will see Africans, of course, live happily. Uh, let's continue with you, Honorable Dr. Rashid. In our preamble this day, we made mention uh, of a series of coup d'etats 
that worked, especially uh, the, the West Africa, some of the West African countries. And of course, I want to understand, uh, in your own perspective, can we see uh, uh, this uh, coup d'etat that uh, occurred uh, a result of uh, a lapse or a fall in democracy in these uh, respective uh, uh, nations? Uh, let's get your perspective on this. Please, can you turn on the mic, Dr. Rashid? Yeah, well, thank you. Okay. What, what is very, very clear to all of us is that democracy is a very expensive business. It requires investment in understanding the system. It requires ensuring that the individuals who are contesting are well equipped. The person who is voting must understand the system and make a choice that has uh, a consequence beyond a personal gain, and there must be an overall interest in what the outcome would be to the general being of people. And the person who is contesting must also understand that he's doing so to satisfy the broad majority of the people. These are very expensive things to come across, you know, to come by. Um, how do we get people to understand that the choices they make are for the general good? How do we get the individuals who are contested to, to know that they are doing so because they want to satisfy a broad majority of people? But how do we get the financing done to make sure that it is not much more expensive than the gains that are coming out of it? So it's very clear that you know we've come to a point when Africa must begin to appreciate wholly what democracy is bringing to us. Uh, I think that we have to appreciate the fact that democracy does not exist without the institutions that strengthen it. The institutions are very critical. And that uh, in order for us to make a move and ensuring that we sustain our democracy, we have to strengthen those democracies. Um, I'm getting it out of loss, out of context. Are you? I wasn't here at one point. Can you repeat part of the question? Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Rashid, we're asking, you know, uh, 2022, some nations across Africa uh, witnessed coup d'etat. I was asking to end this day. Yes. Can we say it's as a result yes. of a failed democracy, or is there any other uh, factor that necessitated uh, the uh, uh, turbulent moment uh, in this country that saw uh, the uh, forceful removal of some leaders across Africa? Yes, so when we get to understand the true import of democracy, mm -hmm. this overall bit and lapses in democracy will begin to relax, you know. But what we are getting is that people don't actually understand what democracy is all about because they are not benefiting out of it. People come into power and then they take advantage of the power they come into to benefit themselves uh, locally at the expense of the broad majority of people. So when they see a soldier man, a military officer walk in and announce the takeover. The same people who have elected the official are the same people who are jubilating. So it is because we need to build a very enlightened society, a conscious majority, and a majority that critical majority that understand what they are doing, and that they will, they will take democracy as a choice and not democracy as a choice of the privileged few. So I I, I think that the many coup d'etats that are happening. Is signaling to the um, attributable failure of democracy in these areas. Mm -hmm. I'm from Ghana, and democracy is such a deep-seated concept now. Anybody talking about coup d'etat, um, it seems to be odd. You know, even though we come to a point when we suffer, we suffer a lot of pain of uh, bad governance, but we 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 don't see coup d'etat as a result of bad governance. So we don't encourage. But where it is still seen, the tasks are still seen as an alternative. It means that the, the, the real concept of democracy has not sunk into the, the fabric of society. People do not see the democracy that they practice as an end, as, as a beginning and an end. For example, you have an election and you have another election, which is to confirm or disconfirm. So, you, you, so, so because 
they cannot see that happening in their lives. It's easy for a military officer to walk, walk in and then pronounce a coup d'etat, and then you see people back in it. Well, but that tells you how fragile that democracy still is in Africa. In Africa, as we observe, we have a long way. A long way from when uh, we decided that wars were the ones that to solve the problems in our chieftaincy struggle, and eventually we got colonized, and we thought that um, colonization was not going to help us. There was a need for us to take power. We took power, and people uh, autocratic their leadership. And then we go to a point when we say, look, those are not what we wanted. We don't want people who stay on and on and on. Kamuzi Banda and Co. stay on and on and on. Uh, you know, we want a situation uh, beyond Mobutu's situation where uh, we can have young people who are coming in, qualified elected leaders. Mm -hmm. And so we get back to it. And then we are not able to sustain it. So we must get to a point in Africa when we say enough is enough. This is our Africa. This is our democracy. This is how we want to move. We don't want a situation where um, people who are tired of confronting leadership now begin to use military weapons fought by the people themselves to safeguard them, to hurt leadership, and to kill the people themselves. We are under, at all costs, in my country, at all costs, we insist that even if leaders are not, Put them out. Don't encourage the military to come in. It is not a choice of leadership. It's not a choice of the people. They cannot be allowed to go on that way. And the military people who you think are coming to save us from the trouble, then become problem themselves. And, and it becomes difficult to move it forward. So I think that uh, the coup is beginning to happen in West Africa. I see to our democratic strife. They are an embarrassment to our African leadership and African people. Uh, when Kuma said that we are beginning to have new Africans who will define who he is, we are defeating that concept of the African personality. Uh, we need to get back to the African personality and get a proud African who will get up and say, this is my country, these are my people, I will sacrifice and die for our people. Not the one who steal money. This, I saw Sanya Pacha when he was overthrown, the money he hauled away, the one carried trying to carry billions of dollars out of the country, and he, she was arrested. I saw in the last regime of Nigeria how billions of dollars were given out to fight Boko Haram, and people kept it to themselves. This is not the Africa we want. We must mention it. We must get to them and tell the truth ourselves, to ourselves that we are losing it out. We are allowing the, individual, the greed of the individual to supersede the interests of the general majority of people. I, and I think that we need to change this conception that democracy is about getting one person in power, getting their friends, and sharing the few resources we have, and getting the people to suffer for it. We, we need to move away from that. I have seen today in Ghana how um, some politicians are deliberately stealing public money, making it difficult for us to have convinced the people that it's, you know, we are, we, they are for us and we are for them. Mm -hmm. I'm a politician. And I keep saying that we need to change a leaf. We need to change our attitude towards our people and our and our economy and our resources and get committed. I want to see a situation where people get out of office, you know, uh, and, and come out and become the individuals they went in for. They went in before they became politicians. So that you can be seen to have benefited so much from power that in the end, you are seen to be the one who stole money, you know. But the pain is that they go to churches and donate, and those are the people they love. I, I am accused all the time because I don't have money to give people because I've been a minister before, I don't have the money people have, and they keep telling me, I, I didn't do well, you have been a minister, how come um, at this time you are suffering to do politics and you are borrowing money? But that's the kind of leadership we want. We want to see a leader still being himself, if you didn't have money when he enters politics, he, your, your, your pay should not make you rich. And, and we don't want a situation where people are seen to be millionaires just because they are in power. I deplore it, and I think that Africa must be a change. There must be a change in Africa. And African leaders must set the examples. And Tanzania's president, former Tanzania's president, whatever the faults he had, I understand he was very good and committed. And those are the kinds of examples I'm talking about.
Absolutely, yeah, Honorable Dr. Rashid. Uh, there is need for politicians sometimes to see eye to eye. Uh, of course, as far as politics is concerned and how uh, we uh, stand uh, for uh, just uh, one goal to transform Africa, to take Africa to the top, of course, to position Africa, uh, especially this time around, uh, that the, the, the political game is changing uh, uh, its dimension. Uh, it's time for, for politicians to see eye to eye and ensure that Africa, of course, takes a bold step and define uh, itself at the international arena. Uh, let's Come back to you, Dr. Dimantia. We continue to analyze uh, constructively uh, how we can sustain democracy and how we can use elections uh, as a vehicle towards sustaining this democracy. We talked about nations that are going to the polls this year, 2023, and we mentioned one nation, which is Libya. I want us to take Libya as a case study today. You know, uh, uh, the past year, Libya was supposed to head to the polls, but that was not actually uh, feasible as the political uh, parties could not come to a compromise. But then, uh, let's see, you talked about Libya having democracy under uh, former president uh, Muammar Gaddafi, and Libya now, we know. The country has been very turbulent. So how do you think, or what do you think can be done to use this election this year to transform every sphere of Libya? We know the country is actually rich, richly blessed, I can see. But then, how can Libyans make good use of these resources by having the peace that they need? Let's look at those elections and see how we can bring back the lost glories of Libya through the forthcoming or the upcoming elections, and of course, bringing back democracy to the uh, North African nation. Yes, like I said before, um, anybody coming up in Libya now to be able to uh, bring back that historic Libya as we knew it, should be able to ensure, to let the people know beforehand that they are going to have the advantages that they had before. I remember I told you, Libya was that kind of a country uh, whereby, very rare in Africa, where people have free health care, housing, and a lot of amenities that they enjoyed. You rarely see Libyans out of the country. Let me tell you, this is one of the facts that we, we, we have to face. Libyans were hardly out of their country. And I, I don't know why people were not asking questions, why Libyans were not going out of the country. But today, you find Libyans almost all around, uh, around the world. It is because... The, the, the environment is no more suiting. The environment is no more fitting to them to live. And I think that anybody who coming up back to Libya now, it should be able to bring back that picture. Let them gather their pieces. And like Barack Obama, one of the things that I admire Barack Obama for, it is one, of course, not many, is the fact that he recognized that if there is a mistake he did as a leader of the United States of America, he was in joining NATO, to invade Libya. And he openly said that. He said that was a mistake that they, they made. And of course, I think that the Libyans should be able to recognize those that were used, those so-called civil society. I'm saying because I'm a leader of a civil society. These are some of the people I call those pan-Africanists who of course are the chichidodos, you know. They pretend to be what they are not. They are what Franz Fanon uh, writes in his book, Black Color, White Mask. You know, you pretend to be what you are not, and that you want to, I mean, you, you are an activist, and you feel that you want to valorize life, you want to defend a cause, but you do that just for your own selfish interest. Because let me tell you, the civil society was very, very their rule was fundamental in the destruction, I would like to underline it, in the destruction of Libya. Libya that today is a dictatorship rather than the democracy that they talked about. Libya in 2011, backward, was a democracy, and they practiced the Jamiriya, and that was one of the best kind of democracy. And I was asking most of other African countries to be able to immediate and do what is suiting to them, do what befit them, do what is working for them. We should not copy and paste. A lot of people are copying and pasting. And therefore, I, I think that if since 2011 up to today, we are in 2000. And uh, 23, which is about 13 years now, 
or 12, 13, and nothing is moving for Libya, then let us know that there was a place where somebody dated water. And it is right that someone goes back and filter the water. water. It is very, very important we have to know that. Without that, nothing is going to happen. There are some people, and you know, uh, the, 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 the last statement of a dying person, like Gaddafi made that statement when he was dying. And Gaddafi said, I am not going to die out of Libya. And if somebody thinks that he's going to intimidate and kill me, I'm going to die for the cause of Libya. And I think that his words are living on. And I think that, look at this so somebody who transformed a whole desert, a whole desert into a farming land. I mean, yeah, I think that sometimes, I, use the, I, I said earlier that it is not just about changing a leader. It's not just about changing a leader. I mean, but it is about assessing the leader, assessing the manifesto of a leader, and actually looking and seeing what is the alternative of changing this leader. Because the alternative is important. Change is good, but what is the alternative change? That is what we have to study. I know, look at someone who worked so hard. Because it was a desert. This man changed Benghazi to family life. Give the people, I mean, and wanted to bring Africa. Let me tell you, the fight of Libya was not just a fight of Libya, it was a fight against the African continent. And let people have to know that. It was not a fight, because that was just a trigger. Libya was just a trigger. It was a fight against the African continent, against the Common African Bank, against the African Common Satellite, and, you know, it was against the United Africa, which uh, Gaddafi incarnated. And I, I remember very well, uh, Nelson Mandela, when he was being interviewed in the United States of America, and he said, uh, and and the, the, the CNN journalist interviewed Mandela and asked him, why is it that you talk and you quote uh, Gaddafi of Libya when we know he's a dictator? Why is it that you speak and you quote uh, Fidel Castro of Cuba when we know that they have been blacklisted? Cuba have been blacklisted, Fidel Castro have been blacklisted. Libya and Gaddafi have been blacklisted and the world in the history of democracy. Why are you quoting them? And, um, and uh, um, Mandela's response was startling. He laughed and told them, uh, the, 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 the mistake people make is that they think that your enemy should necessarily be my enemy. That's yes. they in South Africa. They are quoting these people because these people were for them when they were suffering. Mm -hmm. So do you think that I have to make them my enemies? Not all? They're the enemies of the world. And I said by quoting uh, Arya Shona and said, the whole world can be wrong. The whole world can be wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think that the Libyans, they should come, be united. Uh, I, I think that there is Mandela's son who is also coming up very strongly uh, uh, politically. And sometimes, I there's one, son, yes, uh, there's sometimes it's always good to look back, I mean, in nostalgia. And one of the things that, I mean, is nostalgia in that you see the face of someone who has gone in someone else. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think the Libyans should gather the pieces and come together and say no to the intervention, to the Western intervention in Libya. They came home, they didn't come to, to help the Libya. And now they have destroyed the Libya and, and I mean, uh, uh, suck fat in the Libya or assault. And I think that it is now, if after 11 years, after 12 years, the Libyans and the Africans in general have not, I mean, even in Cote d'Ivoire, people say uh, Ouattara is doing great things. But I still say that is still window dressing, you know. It is window dressing. But we know people who hold this country and hard. You will not come and sell the country to the West. And then you are trying to make some window dressing, masquerade dressing. And then you pe think people will press you. Let people think about the how and cost by coming there. A lot of lives have been lost. And now, and how are you going to repair the lives? And I think that is it. And the politician who put the uh, citizen, the electoral, between the hammer and the anvil, they should be very careful because be tomorrow I see some kind of thing. Tomorrow they reconcile. And when they reconcile, what happened? What happened to the lives that have been lost? So yes. Libyans come back, pick your pieces, and get going. Of course, uh, the goal is to get going, uh, and of course, using uh, the, uh, the the positive uh, or the, the the route that leads to success. Uh, we are almost rounding off uh, this uh, debate program, but then not without getting the viewpoints uh, of uh, the, the other police uh, regarding uh, this uh, uh, this topic. Uh, let's come to you, uh, Mr. Abi. We want to relate democracy and uh, leadership. Do you think uh, these two uh, actually correlate? And if yes, what impact does democracy uh, actually uh, have on leadership in Africa? I'll be honest, it's a very dangerous question, Clarice, because personally, I don't believe that um, uh, election as a popularity contest in that context will just automatically pick um, a perfect leader. 
you can have like what we're pointing out in our um, past um, discussions um, that the best leader would come from an enlightened electorate. I mean, we need a, a population that actually knows why they're electing an individual. So if you have a population that is not enlightened, that doesn't understand what is at stake and can't identify that a leader does not have their interest in, at heart, does not have the future of the nation and the use of the natural resources in the interest of the citizen, then you would have a people who could easily be swayed by a bad leader. Um, votes are bought, um, people are co either coerced, maybe they, they, they don't even have to coerce, they can dash t-shirts and soap and just little menial things. And you see that people use the democratic platform, which is supposed to be such a grandiose and perfect form of selecting a leader to continue to select someone who is a perpetual deviant against them and the whole territory of which they, they live in. So for me to just jump out and say, oh, democracy is just great and it will always guarantee a perfect leader. No, I can't say that because I look at the African context and how we have evolved from colonialism to where we are now to actually honestly admit that our people have not been brought to that level where, like Kumo pointed out in um, his uh, last, last text, um, it was revolutionary warfare, that if we don't have the population actually enlightened to know how to stand up against Africa, to, they, not, they don't know what, what geopolitics are. That's a very powerful term we have to come to acknowledge. If we don't know the way African geopolitics, what goes on in Africa relates to the rest of the world as far as why our resources are valued, why particular um, candidates will always be promoted and the West will turn a blind eye when elections are actually stated to be irregular for one reason or another. If we don't actually take time to look at the, uh, the educational system and question where is it failing to educate the citizens, the youths who are becoming the adults who will become the decision makers tomorrow in each of our 54, is it 56 African countries? If we don't have an educational system that is intentionally telling them the truth about who we are as a people, how our states came to be, what are truly the priorities of a citizen who should really be jealous about seeing their state go forward, that it's going to be very difficult for us to mold individuals who will know that in the next five years or the next seven years, I should abstain from voting for this party candidate or individual because of this reason or that. So it comes down to us really acknowledging that truthfully. Democracy, when we talk about it, it, it sounds like it should be the perfect way of establishing governance and selecting leadership. But because it's really a popularity contest and you're dealing with this idea of the majority not being enlightened and where to know who they're voting for, then that majority and right to select elected individuals seems to continually turn out to elections in which our people are electing bad leadership and then lamenting about it and then not being able to enforce accountability for the duration of a five or seven year mandate and then repeating the same thing over and over again. So does it mean that we'll keep coming and complaining that the system is bad? Or will we actually look at the awareness and enlightenment and education of our people to know the value of their voting and how they are using the electoral system? I think that's the best way I can answer that question. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ambi. Of course, leadership does not only uh, uh, ensure uh, political uh, independence, actually, uh, leadership translates to writing uh, a, a good uh, a trajectory, both uh, uh, in the economic sphere, the social sphere, and uh, what have you. Uh, coming now uh, swiftly to you, uh, uh, Mr. Ezenwa, uh, let's uh, look at this. According to some pundit uh, uh, democracy, the, the, the Western model of democracy is not actually a uh, uh, commensurate uh, in Africa or oh, uh, now does this how can we uh, avoid uh, aspects like which we mentioned earlier on uh, uh, funding uh, post-election uh, violence uh, to avoid this what do you think is the right model of democracy that Africa needs uh? you'll be answering this question as uh, the, the countries are gearing up or preparing towards uh, electing leaders uh, uh, in uh, the coming months. Mr. Ezenwa? 
uh, unfortunately, uh, his mother uh, let me uh, uh, actually channel this question to you, uh, uh, Dr. Honorable Dr. Uh, Rashid. We are looking at uh, the Western type uh, democracy and seeing if it actually uh, suits the African continent uh, context. If no, what do you think is that model of democracy uh, that will actually transform every uh, aspect of the continent Africa uh, to, to reduce uh, uh, the, the post-election violence uh, and, of course, tackle the issue of funding, which goes a long way to the infringement of the sovereignty of nations across Africa? Please, uh, your mic is off. We can't hear you. Uh, democracy, sorry about that. Yeah. Democracy in Africa is taking full steam. We don't, we, we, we have not modified it to suit the African continent. The assumption is that whatever is practiced elsewhere can be practiced in Africa in the same manner. And so we assume that the concept of democracy as defined in books is the same concept we are practicing with the arms of government, with the choice of people through voting, and uh, with the sponsorship of elections by individuals and, and parties collectively, is what define what a democratic system represents to us. So we are not, unfortunately, looking at democracy from the conception uh, of an African identity. Um, let me cite the example of Ghana, um, where we have made an attempt to define our own democracy within the context of Ghana. Um, we started off with the Westminster system of administration or, or governance, where you have a prime minister and you have a president. First, it was a queen, and then we sat the queen and elected a president, and Ghana changed into a republic. And then we made the president uh, a very powerful person and then removed the prime minister and it became a presidential system. We got to a point when we went back to the same, in our second republic, we went back to the same Westminster system of ministerial governance. And then we had a democracy where there was a prime minister and there was a president. And we move along, and the coup d'etat took it away. The first one was a coup d'etat, second one, and then a coup d'etat. And we went to a third administration, that is a third republic, where we have the same, um, we went back to the presidential system, the American type of system, where we have, uh, you know, a written constitution with the president and the vice president without a prime minister. And then, once again, there was a coup d'etat, and then a new administration came. Now, the final thing set by the then coup leader, Jerry John Rawlings, was for us to go back to the presidential system. But this is how we did it, or we have done it. Rather than going back to take wholesale the presidential system or wholesale the prime ministerial system, we combined the two. It became, the, it became a hybrid system in which you have a presidential system where a president is elected, you have ministers coming from parliament, majority of ministers coming from parliament. In the ministerial system, you don't have ministers coming from uh, anywhere else but in parliament. So all the members of the executive come from, the, uh, from, from parliament, including the leader of the party. But in this system, which is presidential, where ministers would normally come from outside parliament, we combine the two. You have some ministers coming from parliament, majority according to the constitution, 50% plus one coming from parliament, and the 49 coming from outside parliament. And so we combine the material and the presidential system, and then it's our system. So this is how we run our system. And it's been running since 1992. And um, that is about uh, some 30 something years. And it's been successful so far. But I don't know whether that can be seen as an African conception of democracy. We, we started off our life as, a, you know, chiefs. And the chiefs are so powerful, they could do anything they wanted, and um, nobody opposed them. And there were no conflicts because somebody is a chief, except in a few situations where their rules are overlooked. 
there was an attached to them um, a, a, mis a mystical feeling that when you offer the chief and elders, you suffer spiritually out of it. And so people feared chiefs and respected them. Um, now, we've taken away the concept of the chief and we brought about the concept of a choice of a leader. And that choice of a leader is assuming huge powers of appointment of everybody. And so it becomes um, like a chief, but less than a chief, because he speaks and people also speak against him. And that's fine, because um, the concept of democracy allows people to oppose each other in and without. Now, whether this is, whether Africa could well along with, with um, a system like this or something else would depend on precedence and it depends on experience. Um, we are going through a system. Many states have lived together, have lived for a thousand years. The United States, which is very example, many exa an example for many, um, has lived for more than 200 years. Our democracy is only about six something years. So we cannot, and we may not compare ourselves with the democracy of the United States. The United Kingdom, where it all started, has been in democracy for more than a thousand years. We are not going to compare ourselves with them. But we are evolving. And I think with time, we are going to evolve a system that is peculiar to us. And I, I believe that the evolution has taken shape and will eventually um, give us a certain evolutionary figure of democracy. And that would have then been our own. If we want to quickly do a swift change, you know, we might run into trouble with that. But I think that experience can always find the way forward. And in our situation, we are we are using our experience to to look at what we can do. One might even ask, why are we saying that in a parliamentary system, in a presidential system, you can have ministers coming from inside parliament? Um, part of our experience is that there were ministers who were completely outside parliament. And so one in, 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 in the third regime, the third republic, the prime minister, the president uh, took a budget to parliament. And the members of parliament said, look, we are the ones who go to fight. We are the ones who face the people. We are the ones who are accused when the, your government is not doing well. And yes, we are not qualified to become ministers. And these are the people who are qualified to minister. They are taking responsibility. They draft something which is not reflecting the will of the people. They bring it to us with a due consultation and with our input. So they refuse to accept the budget until it was gone the second time. So taking all this into experience, into our experience, and um, we decided that let's blend the two. So I can say that this is very Ghanaian. The character is a Ghanaian character. The model is a Ghanaian model, reflecting our, our past and our experience. And it, is, it will be important for other countries to do the same. And what we are doing so far, let me say that I admire the, the, the presentations by my colleagues. Very enlightening, very, very intelligently presented and all that. And I, I want to see also a situation where, you know, we tackle the problem. We of, of the real issues Africans are facing, even if we have to use our own countries, because that will give democracy and this our discussion much more meaning. Because as for the definition that we have there, they are there. You can define, you can say, you can say this, that, this, is that. How is it being practiced in Africa, in Zimbabwe? How is it now practiced in Africa, in, 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 in Rwanda, in, uh, in, in Kenya, and in other places? Why are leaders still stealing so much money in the name of democracy? What can we do to absolve this problem? Clear examples of people who are doing that. You know, you can find some of the richest people in Africa and you can put that leaders and they are part of the richest people. When they get the money, what kind of businesses do they do? Is that the democracy we want to see? Because in everything we do, it's about the people. Here, yeah, people are poor. And I, I like it when a doctor um, said that um, you, you see poverty working on all less in, in many of African countries. It is true. Poverty is alive. Poverty is standing, is very arrogant. It's insisting you know, that it will live in Africa. And it's because our leaders perpetrate it. They are it. If you don't use your national resources well, you go borrowing all the time. You borrow to run an election. You borrow to build toilets. You borrow to build markets. What then can we do with the vast resources at our disposal? You can't tell. Africa has the, the best of resources in the world. And yes, it's, a, it's worse in terms of poverty. And Nigeria is the sleeping giant. I like Nigeria because it is so rich. But I, I'm, I'm amazed at Nigeria because it's so poor. The poorest people in Africa are found in Nigeria. 
So how, 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 how can we be like this? So we must begin to say the truth, give ourselves a benchmark. When we come to talk about it next year, we'll say that because we have discussed and pointed out these things, we have seen some changes taking place in Ghana because uh, a Ghanaian pointed out the situation that their leaders are corrupt. They are not giving enough resources to the people. Leaders are becoming too rich. And then they'll question. And the journalists will ask them, we, we understand when you sign off to come president, you only said you have two houses. Now we can find 10 houses in your name. Where did you find them? You know, we want to see this. We want to question. We want to see civil society awake and, and be able to question leaders for what they do. Democracy as a whole is just a concept. The basis of it is we are looking out at. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Rashid, uh, Member of Parliament for Wakanda Central and ex-Minister of State. He joined us live uh, from Ghana. Also, uh, sending uh, thanks uh, to uh, uh, Mr. Ambe Fokwa, Indigenous uh, uh, Advocate, Cultural Advocate, who joined live from Ghana. Thank you, sir, for the great insight on uh, this uh, topic for today. Uh, we're acknowledging still the presence uh, of Mr. Ezenwa Nwago, who joined uh, from uh, Nigeria in his capacity as the executive uh, director of hearing advocacy and uh, advancement uh, center in uh, Africa. Of course, uh, immense thanks to Dr. Uh, uh, Michael Dimanjo, Civil Society and uh, General Coordinator for New Era Youth for Africa. It was a pleasure having uh, this uh, 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 a panel of experts to uh, uh, give insight on this very important topic, especially as nations are gearing towards elections in Africa. And then we're ending to say there is need for these countries preparing for elections to choose leadership that will ensure that the tenets of democracy are upheld in the country to see that Africa defines the model of democracy that uh, actually uh, works for, for the continent that will bring positive change in every sphere, be it political sphere, social sphere, and especially the economic sphere, changing the, uh, the, the, the living standard of all Africans. There is a wind of change, which is, of course, very positive, blowing across the continent of Africa. Thanking you all for participating by leaving your comments on our Facebook page, Africa Media TV. Also acknowledging the Tenika crew for ensuring the smooth run of the program. Thank you all for always trusting the Pan-African television. It is on this note that we draw curtains into today's edition of the program. But that's not all. Keep having a lovely moment in the company of transmissions. Bye.